All right, annual Japan Q&A video. Let's just uh, get started. Shin-san, what's, it, uh, what's the experience like moving into a new house in Japan for the first time? Any specific things to take note of? My only advice, generally speaking, for moving in Japan is if you're alone and you don't have that many possessions, move by yourself. But if you're married, hire a moving company. <laughs> Don't don't try and save money. Hire a moving company. <laughs> there are multiple moving companies. The way that you want to do it is you want to call up maybe two or three. And you get a an estimate from each, and then you you get them to do like a bidding war and get lower and lower and lower until you feel like it's actually like a fair price. The other thing that I wanted to mention when it comes to moving in Japan is that in my experience living in different types of living accommodations, whether that's an apartment or a mansion or a, a house at this point um, is that it's you typically don't really need to do anything um, when you're moving into an apartment in terms of greeting the people that you live next to. The thing about apartments, of course, is that people come and go, right? You're, I, all the apartments that I had in Japan, I was never in one single place for more than more than a, a year and a half, maybe two years at the longest. And I know that there are many people that have been in the same apartment for a long time, but generally speaking, you know, you're gonna be in there for a limited amount of time and then you're gonna move. But when I moved into this house that we have right now, I learned that, and this again kind of makes sense because you actually own the house and when you build a house and when you build a house anywhere, again, the assumption is that you are gonna be there for at least a very, very long time. And in that sense, it's not, typically sufficient just to greet the people that live on, you know, immediately next to you. And we actually had to, we didn't have to, but I learned that it was customary and we did do this to buy gifts for every single person um, on our on our block. And this leads me to a second thing, actually. I believe that we went to to those eight or nine different houses two times. Once when we, when they started doing construction to say, hey, we're moving into this house, um, uh, or we're building this house, sorry, it's gonna be loud for a little while. And then again, after we officially moved in, just keep in mind that if you like to keep to yourself, if you're more of an introvert, a house might not be the best option for you in Japan because it inherently, 99% of cases is going to require you to interact with people much more than something like an apartment. Okay, being being vegan in Japan, uh, question mark. And then there's a question about uh, Duolingo, Duolingo as well. I'm not gonna answer the Duolingo question because I've never used that app, but I was a vegan, like a full proper vegan for about three years in Japan. These days, um, I also eat fish and I also eat eggs fairly regularly. And then every now and then, if I'm like with like a YouTube buddy um, and you know, we go out to dinner or something like that, and there's not a vegan option there, then I don't have a major qualm with like, you know, eating meat in, in that particular setting. But the one thing that I can say, and this is going to get into a little bit more of a deeper topic, but it, it is significantly harder to be a vegan in Japan than it is in the United States. And one of the reasons for that is because vegan culture in general is just a much more, is a much newer thing in Japan than it is in the United States. One of my general rules of thumb for life in Japan in general is that everything that becomes popular in the United States becomes popular in Japan five to 10 years later. What I really wanna talk about in this talk, when it comes to health in Japan in general, Japan actually allows a lot of, what's the term? No zai, no yaku zai, uh, like pesticides as well as food preservatives that are actually no longer allowed in a lot of other first world countries. So I know that there are a lot of strawberry farms in Japan that use what's considered outside of Japan to be a very dangerous pesticide. I don't know if it's if it's a pesticide or I don't think the, the term fertilizer is correct. It's some kind of chemical that either keeps the bugs away or it either makes the plants grow uh, faster. Either way, it's considered outside of Japan to be a very dangerous chemical. And because of this, Japan can't export these strawberries to countries such as the United States. Like they're legally not allowed to because, Amer because these chemicals in the United States are completely outlawed. And that was pretty shocking for me to learn. Trans fats, I believe, are not allowed in uh, food in the United States as well. So like when I was growing up, I always had peanut butter that 
one of the ingredients was partially hydrogenated soybean oil. So hydrogenated fats, I believe, um, or hydrogenated oils, I believe that they are no longer allowed in the United States because there was a bunch of evidence that came out that said, this is really, really, really bad for you. <laughs> And so the United States, I be, uh, the FDA, I guess, they said, we can't have this, it's gone. But these are still allowed in Japan, actually. And this is particularly true for convenience store foods. So I'm very, very sad to be the one to break this news to everyone because I know, myself included, uh, I love convenience store foods so much. But um, for the past like two or three years, I haven't I've barely touched any of the junk food in convenience stores because I know how how bad it is for me. So like I go to convenience stores all the time because they're extremely convenient in Japan and they've got a lot of great options that don't contain all these food preservatives. Plain hard boiled eggs and then maybe a bag of, um, what do you say, plain nuts. So no oils or anything like that. But like if you're, if you, if you're having like, you know, uh, these like, fluffy egg sandwiches or like the peanut butter like uh, sandwiches that are in the bags or essentially any kind of food you know like the metal pong all the kinds of like breads and donuts and stuff like that that they have in convenience stores i can almost guarantee you that that stuff is loaded with stuff that's that's not healthy i'm not trying to say like japan is really bad like i'm saying that some of the options that are available are dangerous. But if you just choose something else, you'll be you can you can be very healthy. It's just you once you have to have the knowledge, right? So I'm trying to just spread knowledge. Okay, what is healthcare like in Japan? How expensive is it? If we zoom out to like a macro level, Japanese healthcare is quite good. And what I mean by that is it's relatively cheap, especially if you can compare it to uh, it's relatively cheap for most people, especially if you can compare it to like the U.S. health uh, healthcare, Obamacare, I forget what it's called, um, or like various private um, insurance plans that they have in, in the United States or other countries. Um, and generally speaking, most hospitals have uh, pretty good equipment as well. So like it's pretty easy to get an MRI for fairly cheap in Japan. Um, so that's, you know, that's a wonderful thing, right? It's very, very good for a lot of things, but it, it's also, it can be a little bit tricky for other things. And what I mean by this is that, of course, one of the issues that Japan is facing right now is the depopulation crisis, right? And my experience is that every single time that I visit a hospital, I have to wait a very, very, very long time Primarily because, well, obviously because there are so many uh, old people there and old people naturally have more health conditions than young people do. There's a lot of old people in, in hospitals that are there just because they're worried, even if they don't have an issue. And a lot of doctors immediately recognize this. And I think that they've become slightly jaded because of this. Again, if you see like five or six uh, patients in a row and they're all like, doctor, I'm, I feel like something's wrong. I'm, you know... But I don't know exactly what, I just want to make sure that I'm okay, you know, kind of like for the peace of mind, then that might be a little bit frustrating, aggravating for a doctor, and you might get a little bit jaded because of that. But if that ends up affecting your judgment for people that actually have serious health issues, then that's a dangerous thing. So I've had my fair share of experiences where I waited two hours or maybe three hours to see a doctor that didn't really care about me and just gave me some like medicine that didn't help at all. And then I ended up having to go to a different doctor, a better doctor later on, because again, my issue didn't get any better. Hopefully that's a uh, beneficial information for some of the people out there. Okay, next question. Okay, so Marcos says taxes. Okay, which is the only certain thing together with death. Yeah, indeed. Two things I'd like to mention here. One thing very briefly, the one thing being that if you're a foreigner in Japan and you're trying to figure out taxes by yourself, don't, just hire a professional. A good accountant will always pay by, pay for themselves. The other thing that I wanna say is that, because I don't think I've talked about this um, in detail before, is that, of course, because of the depopulation crisis and because of the economic stagnation, they're interconnected, of course, very much so, but 
there are also there are many economic issues that don't deal so much with uh, the older generation. The older generation is a tremendous stress on the Japanese economy, but it's not the only reason that the Japanese economy isn't doing so hot right now. One of the main reasons, as far as I can tell, is a general lack of innovation. Think about all the really popular smartphone companies, right? What do you have? You have American companies, South Korean companies, and you have Chinese companies. You know, uh, Apple. We've got Samsung. We've got uh, Xiaomi, uh, is it Huawei? Um, and maybe there's like one Japanese company that might come to mind, which would be Sony. And Sony makes incredible smartphones. I love Sony as a company. I think that they're, they're incredible. Um, and they're, the smartphones that they make are, they're technical marvels. They, they stand their own, they stand their ground when compared to iPhones or any other, you know, smartphone for that matter. But their share of the market is quite low compared to, of course, like Apple or Samsung. Think about all the apps that you use as well. They're either, you know, like Snapchat or Facebook or uh, Instagram or Twitter, you know, Silicon Valley apps or TikTok, right? So again, it's like America and, and China. The point that I'm trying to make here when it comes to taxes is that the Japanese economy is not doing so hot right now. And more and more young people each year um, are paying into the pension system such that the older people can get the social security that they paid into when they were young. But because of the demographics and because of the economic situation, this system is getting, is getting very, very stressed. I've heard one argument against this that says that's not true if, if, you, if you make, um, young people aren't bearing the, the burden of this in a disproportionate way. Um, like if you look at the amount of money that the average young person gets taxed, it's not that high. And this is actually true as far as I can tell. That being said, <clears throat> the average or the the young person that makes the that makes above the average amount of money gets taxed significantly. In the 10 years or so that I've been in Japan, um, not only have what do you say, consumption tax, sales tax? Yeah, sales taxes have gone from 3% to 5% to 8% to 10%. They're probably gonna go up again. But in addition to that, income taxes as well, particularly for the upper brackets, have increased pretty dramatically as well. So um, just in the couple of years that I've been doing YouTube, the percentage of my income that I pay into taxes each year has has gone up. Expect to pay a lot in taxes if you're doing well in Japan. <laughs> I don't want to be too redundant on this point. Any advice for landing a job after ALT work currently on JET? Cur curious to see if you have any recommendations as I'm trying to extend my stay past my teaching tenure three to four years from now. Would love to land somewhere in localization. This is something that I've also been meaning to talk talk about for a while. AI is so disruptive right now in Japan that I think Translation for sure is not a market that I would encourage people to get into. The reason being that even if you say, well, yes, but translation translators are always going to be uh, wanted for things like fiction, right? Uh, there's going to be a lot of authors that refuse to use AI because they want a human to translate their book or their movie or whatever it might be. And that's probably true for the overwhelming majority of cases. However, there's already a ton of translators and interpreters that are already beginning to lose work because of AI. I, well, I just believe that you you won't want to get into that market because the, it's going to be so competitive. Um, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that I was pretty confident in recommending a different a variety of different ways of searching for work in Japan, maybe like four or five years ago. I would say, you know, I think programming is a pretty safe bet. I think that... Um, these are things I said in the past. Again, I think programming is a pretty safe bet. I think that uh, YouTube and like uh, Twitch are actually pretty good for people that are more uh, created, uh, creative. And um, these days, I frankly, I just don't know. <laughs> Apple just announced a uh, Apple Vision Pro. And by the time that that gets to its fourth or fifth generation, the world is just going to look completely different. It's going to be an even bigger leap than the pre and post uh, smartphone revolution, right? Uh, because AR and VR is going to provide so many 
fundamentally different experiences than this, you know, four cornered screen that we were, we're used to looking at, whether it's a, a tablet or a computer or a phone. In that sense, I think that probably the safest thing to do, I'm not trying to say that this is, is the funnest, the most fun thing to do, or what you should personally be doing, but probably the, the most secure option is to do something that involves AR or VR, um, whether that's programming specifically for that or developing specifically for, for that, or you could try and get on like a creative team at a company, like a, a, a media company. I know that Disney is trying to lean in uh, Disney was in Apple's like keynote as well. And they said, we're already working on like this 3D content. So there's probably a bunch of studios right now that are uh, going to be focused on 3D expansive content. And so that in, in my mind, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to turn out true or not, but that seems like probably the safest route. If uh, career security, job security isn't the most important thing to you, uh, when it comes to work in general, but you're, st you're still looking for work advice, working in Japan advice, I would say try and become an expert at three different things. Corrupt Politician <laughs> says, what are some of your favorite Japanese films? I really like uh, Takashi, Takashi Miike. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I shouldn't say that I'm a big fan of his in general because I've seen more movies of his that I don't like than movies of his that I do like. But at the same time, two of my favorite Japanese movies were both directed by him. One being uh, Audition, and the other being 13 Assassins. He also did, uh, I think, Ichi the Killer? Yeah, he did Ichi the Killer um, as well. If you explore his, his library at large, besides just the stuff that gets you know, picked up by the media because how crazy it is, then you'll, you can find movies like 13 Assassins, which is, it has a lot of gore, more gore than the typical like uh, R-rated movie, which is already saying a lot, but it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal movie. Okay, Randy says, why is Famichiki uh, the best konbini fried chicken? This relates to what I said earlier. When we foreigners talk about uh, Japanese convenience stores, uh, the general consensus is, look how amazing this is. Everything is so fun. Everything is so good. Everything is, is wonderful. And again, Japanese convenience stores can be wonderful and they are uh, extremely convenient. But I'm quite terrified of uh, what kind of oils that they might be using in Famichiki. Please be careful. <laughs> okay, so Anthony Lamb has asked a very interesting question, which it's quite long, so I can't read this whole thing, but he's essentially saying that, okay, we've seen how Japanese, the culture surrounding Japan has changed over the recent years through, again, streaming services and other tools and the internet in general, but how do you envision Japanese culture changing? Japan is in dire straits right now. We talked about this earlier in this video. We talked about how the Japanese economy isn't doing so well, and there's proof of this in like the smartphone market. We talked about how a lot of the foods, uh, the ingredients that are in a lot of food products aren't that great. And of course, uh, the swelling pension system and the depopulation crisis, uh, increasing taxes. It's probably, you know, sales tax is probably going to go up again soon in the, in the near future. What does Japan have in store? Um, and I think that there's two, two ways you could look at this. It's either the glass is half full or the glass is half empty, of course. And I think that the more pessimistic argument is that Japan has no future. Um, this equation of variables when it comes to the Japanese economy and the demographic, the Japanese population, like this is a recipe for disaster. No country can get out of this situation. Um, and those that have, have only done so by accepting a lot of immigrants. I, I think that Germany might be a successful example of this. It, Germany, or maybe it was it France, I can't remember exactly. I apologize if, I, if I'm getting that wrong. But of course, Japan is kind of notorious for not accepting a ton of foreigners each year. It's uh, relatively speaking, Japan is still extremely uh, a Japanese country. Again, the more pessimistic argument is Japan will never change and get out while you can kind of. And we've actually seen this with a fair number of young, successful, 
not even young, just successful people leaving Japan. There's a lot of Japanese people that um, once they become a little bit successful, they end up moving out of Japan because either the taxes are so much or because the future is brighter outside of Japan. It's maybe the best way to say it, is, is what they seem to think. Or if they didn't believe that, they'd still be in Japan, right? And I think that there's a lot of uh, evidence that that may very well happen. But I'm actually of the argument that, uh, of the belief that Japan will be able to get through this. Um, it may take 50 years and there's probably going to be a lot of growing pains. But the reason that I'm personally optimistic is because of Japanese culture and the history of Japan at large. In the last Japan Q&A video that I, I made, I talked about how um, Japan, I talked about the Nankai Megathrust earthquake, how Japan, I believe the statistic was 25% of all earthquakes that occur in the world occur in or immediately uh, around Japan, because Japan is on, I believe, three separate tectonic plates. And every 300 years, Japan gets hit by this Nankai megathrust earthquake, which is, imagine the 311 earthquake that we saw 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago, um, 12 years ago? Anyway, um, imagine that only occurring in a an even more spread out location because the it'll happen across multiple tectonic plates as opposed to just a single one. So Japan is expected to get hit by this, this massive earthquake in the relatively near future. If you look at Japanese history, it has happened every 300 years for as long as there's data available. The point that I'm trying to make is Japan's still here, right? The, J the Japan that all of us love, that I love, is still here. Japan has been hit by so many disasters uh, over and over and over again. And every single time, arguably speaking, they've been able to rise from the ashes and make something even better. You can say that about the earthquakes. Um, maybe another example of this, though, is, and I'm going to try and tread lightly here because uh, this is a sensitive topic, but is post-World War II. Japan was not in good shape after World War II. And of course, uh, the Americans came in, they had their occupation for a little bit, but in very little time, Japan ended up, ended up becoming the world's number two superpower. Japan seems to be actually pretty good at rising from the ashes and um, making it out the other end. And I do think that um, things are going to get a lot worse, a lot worse before they ever get better. Um, but I'm prepared to ride through it. And I, I'm particularly uh, optimistic that the younger generation of Japanese people, like my daughters, are going to be extremely tough and resilient. And because they're going to grow up during probably a relatively difficult time. And so I think that if I think that Japan will get through this and that when they do, that young, strong, resilient generation will be able to make Japan even better. I'm putting my chips in that direction. I'm optimistic for the future of Japan and hopefully that's a, a, a bright note to end the video on. I'm just gonna ramble if I don't. So thank you for watching the video and I'll talk to you guys again soon. Sayonara. <laughs>